guys, it's Claire. Welcome back and welcome to another reading vlog. It has been a while since I've done one of these, but I've been feeling very wintry and cozy lately and thought that it might be a nice time to do a little seasonal reading vlog. And I thought I would kick it off tonight because New York is allegedly supposed to get a lot of snow in the next 24 hours. I do sometimes think that New York weather is overreported, so we'll see if any of this precipitation actually materializes. But either way, I am always happy to have an excuse to stay inside and do absolutely nothing. So that is my plan for the next 48 hours to just stay inside, relax, recharge, read a little bit. I mentioned in my most recent video talking about my early 2022 reading that my reading year is off to a really good start and so I'm almost feeling a little bit superstitious about only wanting to continue reading great books. So the two books that I currently have next up on the docket are Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, which I saw on both Jennifer from Insert Literary Pun Here and Alex from Big Al Books's Best Books of 2021 list. They both raved about it and then I found a copy of this in a used bookstore a couple of weeks ago. It's supposed to be an extremely funny spoof of kind of rural, English novels that were popular between the world wars and I read about 20 pages of it this morning and it definitely is quite funny so far. It follows a 19 year old woman named Flora Post whose parents have died of influenza so more timely than we might have hoped for but now she is picking and choosing amongst her relatives about who she's going to go and live with and mooch off of for the foreseeable. And it appears that she will be going to Sussex to stay with her rural relatives on the eponymous Cold Comfort Farm. So I think I might actually burrow into this one a little bit tonight because it seems cozy and light. The other book that I've read about 20 pages of is Starlight by Richard Wagamies. I've mentioned several times about how I want to be reading more Richard Wagamies this year. Medicine Walk was one of my favorite books of last year that I read right at the end of the year and this is the sequel to Medicine Walk. It follows Franklin Starlight who is a teenager in that book. In this book he is a grown adult man and this is the book that Richard Wagamies I believe was working on when he passed away a few years ago unexpectedly and so I do think that the end of this book maybe isn't fully finished. Like I said I've read a few chapters of this so far and already there is a kind of opening chapter with Franklin where he is chasing wolves out in the middle of the night to take photos of them and so that's where this image from the cover of the book comes from and Richard Wagamese just writes about the landscape and the wild in a way that nobody else does and it's just the kind of scenes and writing that you just want to luxuriate in and let seep into your bones and so I'm really excited to get farther into this and see what else is in here. I am going to make a little bit of dinner, get cozy, and hopefully get some good reading in tonight. So the weather last night and for most of today did end up delivering quite a lot of snow and so I have mostly stayed inside today just trying to stay cozy and warm and I've been reading some more of Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons. I'm approaching the halfway point of the book and so Flora has arrived at Cold Comfort Farm and has started to meet the various characters and family members who populate it. I'm not entirely sure if I'm familiar with the type of book that this is supposed to be satirizing. I feel like I I've read that it is a satire of the agricultural British novel set between the world wars, but then the back of this book says it's a satirization of the melodramatic English novel so widely read in the 19th century. So I don't know if that means like the Brontes and 
Thomas Hardy. I definitely feel like there are characters in this book that remind me of some of the characters out of the Brontes. It is kind of that quintessential city girl, goes to the countryside, doesn't know what's going on, thinks that she's going to help improve things, and then I mean, TBD on what's gonna happen to Flora. I am finding it funny. There are just certain running gags, like how everyone on the farm doesn't refer to her as Flora, but instead refers to her as Robert Post's child, who is their relation, who they've all done wrong in some way. And then I'm also making some spaghetti sauce. It's my mom's old spaghetti recipe that she hasn't made in a really long time, and I've also never made it, so that's on the stove. And then I will check in with you on more of my reading updates later. Hello, so I have a couple of reading updates for you. My radiator is hissing and wheezing in the background like a dying animal, so if you can hear that, don't worry about it. My first update is that I have stalled out a little bit on Cold Comfort Farm by Stella Gibbons, which is not because I'm not enjoying it, but it's also not funny enough that it's something that I find myself reaching for in a kind of down moment. I think it's telling that this book is only 250 pages long and I'm having trouble kind of getting through the last 100 pages of it. Again, not because it is dense or slow while reading it, but simply because I'm not thinking about it. So I don't know, it's kind of one of those situations of I'm not disliking it, but I'm also not seeing the point of why I'm reading it. I am going to return to it because like I said, I have less than 100 pages. So I do want to kind of just finish it out and see if it's more of the same or if there's something else here beyond that. So I will report back on that in a little bit. In the meantime though, one of the other reasons I haven't been picking up Cold Comfort Farm is that after finishing Just Last Night by Vary McFarlane and loving it, I went and checked my library catalog and requested some of the physical copies of Vary McFarlane that they had. The two that they currently had on their shelves were Who's That Girl, which is one of her earlier books from 2015 or 2016, and then If I Never Met You. This one came out in 2020. You can even see by their covers, maybe I should hold them this way, you can see the sort of vast changes that have occurred in the marketing and design and packaging of romance, women's fiction, chiclet in the space of, you know, the last four or five years. This book legit looks like it came out in 2012 and I was a little bit shocked that it was as recent as 2016 just because, wow, I didn't realize that books were still being packaged like this even just a few years ago. But If I Never Met You was in transit to my local branch for a long time, so I got Who's That Girl first and ended up reading it simply because that was the one available and I was a little bit skeptical just because this cover is not doing Vara McFarlane any favors, which is honestly a shame because I ended up really, really loving this book as well. Maybe loving is a bit too strong a word, but I really, really liked it. I think that Just Last Night is probably a stronger book overall, just in terms of its themes and um, its pacing and all of that stuff. But Who's That Girl was definitely fun, especially given that I was just in the mood for more of this author. It follows a 35-year-old woman named Edie who is living a sort of ritzy life in London. She's originally from up north in Nottingham. So Edie is one of those people who kind of fled her hometown to go make it as a city girl and has been doing that for the last several years. She is at the wedding of a colleague and ends up accidentally kissing the groom. So her whole social and professional world implodes. She ends up going back up to Nottingham to kind of wait out the wreckage of that whole situation. And she is assigned by her boss to work as the ghostwriter on an autobiography for a very hot, famous young actor who is very much supposed to be like either Richard Madden or Kit Harington from Game of Thrones. He's on a show called 
blood and gold or something like that. She ends up spending a lot of time with him, finding out more about him, blah, blah, blah. And then there are some other threads going on with his life and then her relationship with her father and her sister, who she ends up staying with during this kind of retreat to Nottingham. And so similar to just last night, I would say that this is more women's fiction in the sense that it is not purely focused on the romance and it also doesn't hit all of the exact requirements of a romance novel per the genre rules. That being said, similar to just last night, I feel like it kind of hit everything that I want out of a romance in terms of the building of the relationship, the banter, the kind of subtle angst and slow burn quality of it. And then also I think it is fairly satisfying despite an ending that I think is vaguely controversial in that it's maybe a little bit ambiguous, but not actually ambiguous. I think it's a little bit of a cop-out and a little bit lazy, but also the book kind of did all the other emotional work that I needed before that, so I am at peace with it. That sounds very ominous, but it's not. I think you're gonna enjoy this book if you're in the mood for kind of comfort reading really good chiclet. I know we're not supposed to use the term chiclet anymore, but because we don't have a better replacement term for that currently as a society, I feel like I only mention the term chiclet because I think something about this book, maybe because it has that very funny, sharp, British kind of humor that is reminiscent of Bridget Jones, which is like the chiclet urtext or whatever. Because of that, this book feels a little bit more chiclety to me than like women's fiction, because I don't think women's fiction always is funny. And then the last thing I did want to say about Vari McFarland that I've been enjoying so far based on the two books of hers that I've read now is that unfortunately I guess I'm getting to an age where I'm finding her 30-something mid-30s heroines incredibly compelling. I'm turning 30 this year, let's not talk about it, but I think these characters who are kind of far enough into life that they have regrets is really interesting and I'm just finding it more satisfying and rewarding to see these people who have been through it in various ways simply by virtue of having existed on the planet longer. I'm finding it very rewarding to see them kind of come around to their various happy endings. So I have this other Vary McFarland and Cold Comfort Farm on my allegedly immediate TBR. We'll see what happens and I will give you an update in a little bit. So I have some overdue reading updates for you. The first being that I took a break from my Vari McFarlane Chiclet Marathon to go back to Cold Comfort Farm finally. I'm filming this vlog over the course of like the end of January and all of February. So I took about a three week break between the first half of this book and then sat down the other night and just blasted through the last hundred pages or so of the book. And you know, I enjoyed this book. I think that my feelings about it ultimately are that it was funny and delightful in a lot of ways. I think especially each line kind of had some sort of funny, clever, or absurdist detail to it that was really wonderful. But as a whole, once you step back from it, I don't really know that there's a need to read it, which I guess was kind of an annoying thing to say because you could say that about a lot of different books. But I think I have been pondering it particularly when it comes to classics because this is a classic but one that is a little bit more overlooked at least in America or North America. It's certainly not nearly as popular or as known as a lot of other classics and I think part of that is because it is satirical and it's riffing on another genre that kind of requires you to be familiar with other kinds of classics to fully appreciate what this one is doing. I did look into it and these books are specifically a spoof on 
books from authors like Sheila K. Smith and Mary Webb, authors of books that fell into the loam and the love child genre. This is per Wikipedia. In contrast to say something like Wide Sargasso Sea, which is totally referencing Jane Eyre, but because Jane Eyre is such a kind of a flagstone of the English canon. I think that that has allowed Wide Sargasso Sea to become a modern classic in its own right. Cold Comfort Farm, not so much. So yeah, I ultimately don't really know what to make of this one. I enjoyed it. I don't not recommend reading it, but I also can't really think of a reason why you need to rush out and read it tomorrow or at any point in the future. In terms of the next books on my list, I know that I initially said at the beginning of this vlog that I wanted to read some Richard Wagamese this month, which has not happened. I feel like I have fully been sucked into the Vari McFarlane chiclet black hole and honestly I'm loving every minute of it so I'm just going to continue to lean in that direction. I've started If I Never Met You which follows a character named Lori who is 36 and works at a law firm and whose partner of 18 years breaks up with her at the start of the book and then she is sort of recovering from the fallout of that and ends up fake dating a young hotshot playboy character named Jamie who also works at her office. Also her ex of 18 years works at the same office. So it's this whole thing to kind of try and save face while he's moving on and then blah blah blah. It has all the kind of convoluted things that you expect to find in a fake dating setup. There's something about her writing that I just find incredibly easy to inhale. These are just reliably books that I will stay up late reading, which I feel like doesn't happen to me often. And another thing that I'm enjoying is that I'm reading these all out from the library. I feel like every time I finish one, another one is ready to pick up. I'm just letting them wash over me in a way that I think is a nice change of pace and has been kind of exactly what I've wanted for my sort of doldrums February reading and so I thought about kind of forcing myself back in the direction of literary fiction and Richard Wagamese which I will eventually circle back to but for now I've decided to just go with the flow as long as my library holds keep coming in so that's where I'm at with that which is also perfect because tomorrow my friend Sarah and I are doing a romance reading day at her apartment so I am going to head up there I am going to take if I never met you and then also it's not me it's you so yeah we're just going to have a nice cozy sit around and read romance kind of day. Hello, it is the following weekend because I am incapable of vlogging or giving reading updates during the work week, which continues to swallow my life. Sarah and I had a great romance reading day last Monday, actually, which was President's Day. I have continued a pace with Vari McFarlane's catalog. Since I checked in with you last time, I have finished reading If I Never Met You and then have also started and finished it's not me, it's you. And I wanted to sit down and talk about both of these books together because although they were published six years apart, these books have literally the exact same plot. Like I was gobsmacked when I was reading the first couple chapters of It's Not Me, It's You being like, I just read this. Basically both books follow a heroine in her 30s who is coming off the implosion of a 10 plus year relationship. And in both instances it is a shock split for the heroine and also involves cheating on their ex's parts. And so the first hundred pages or so of both books follow very similar beats in terms of these heroines grieving the relationship and then also kind of trying to throw themselves into a new life. When I finished reading If I Never Met You, it was definitely my least favorite of the three Vari McFarlane books I had read so far. I enjoyed it. It's one of those books that I found myself picking up and just kind of devouring at all hours, but I also think that fake dating is a big part of that 
book and I don't always love the sort of convoluted circumstances that is inherently a part of the fake dating trope and I think I especially don't like it when it's like adults in their 30s who are otherwise well adjusted. It just kind of feels cringy to me and also the moments of closeness and intimacy feel very manufactured as opposed to organic and so even though I liked Jamie and Lori as a hero and heroine and even though I enjoyed reading the book ultimately by the end of it I didn't really believe in them as a couple as much as I have in other Vary McFarlane books. And also there was a lot of trauma plot in If I Never Met You. I'm using the Perul Sagal definition of trauma plot as like using trauma to uh, deepen the characters and kind of give them greater heft and significance, which I think is a common thing that often happens in romance and women's fiction. And it's definitely something that has popped up in Vary McFarlane's books, but this was the most egregious use of it where it was just all of this trauma coming up and it was also like the primary thing that Jamie and Lori were bonding over was being able to share those secrets and that past trauma with each other which is a great thing cool but also is that the basis of a relationship I don't know all of that being said enjoyed that book didn't love it but it didn't stop me from continuing down the Vary McFarlane path. It's Not Me, It's You has a little bit more of the quality of Who's That Girl, where it was published a couple years before her publishers clearly kind of switched to packaging her books as rom-coms in the kind of cartoon cover mold of the last few years. And also they seem to, in those later books, have kind of trimmed down her books a little bit more. So the, the more recent ones are around 400 pages long. And then Who's That Girl and It's Not Me, It's You are like over 500 pages, which is insane for a women's fiction novel, but her books read so fast that it kind of doesn't matter. And I found that It's Not Me, It's You is like Who's That Girl in that it's a little bit longer long-winded and rougher around the edges, but I kind of liked that. It kind of just deepened the world and this heroine's life a little bit more. And you know, the plot of this book is like pretty wacky. Basically, Delia, the heroine, moves down to London temporarily to stay with her friend in the fallout of the end of this relationship and the discovery that her long-term partner has been cheating on her. She moves down to London from Newcastle and takes a job at a really sort of dubious PR firm and her boss is clearly somewhat nefarious. She makes a lot of bad decisions but then also crosses paths with a journalist who is basically trying to bust her boss. It ends up being very wacky and kind of madcap and sort of hijinks ensue in a way where sometimes I was like what am I reading? I don't really know. But at the end of the day I really enjoyed it. I read it in like two days. I really liked the hero of the book and the dynamic between him and the heroine. Definitely not at the same level of Just Last Night or Who's That Girl, but better and more fun than If I Never Met You. And you know, like clockwork, the second that I was done reading It's Not Me, It's You, I got a notification from my library that my next Vary McFarland hold was ready for pickup. And so this will be my fifth book of hers. And I have her other two that are out on hold right now. And so yeah, I kind of think that as long as I'm in the mood for it, I'm just going to continue reading her books, maybe sprinkling in some other kinds of reads in the meantime. But falling down this reading rabbit hole, I think has just been a really nice treat the last few weeks. And I do think that I would like to, once I have read all of her books, potentially do a kind of ranking of the various aspects of it, maybe niche content, but I'm feeling enthusiastic about it. Matthew Sharapa and Jen from Insert Literary Pun Here are coming over tomorrow to continue watching Lord of the Rings, which we started last weekend. I mentioned to them a while ago that I have never read or seen any of the Lord of the Rings movies. I've definitely seen them like in the background throughout my childhood while my brothers were watching them, but I've never seen them front to back myself. So last weekend we started the whole trilogy, we are watching the extended editions per Matthew and Jennifer's <laughs> decree. So we only got through the first two hours and 40 minutes of Fellowship of the Ring last weekend, and then they're coming over tomorrow and we're gonna finish that and potentially watch part of Two Towers. And you know, I'm enjoying it so far. The movies are beautiful. I feel like visually they're still really stunning and hold up. It is a little bit 
men talking in rooms or in forests or on cliff tops kind of vibe, which is part of why I could not get through all of Game of Thrones, the TV show, because it was just too much talking. And I definitely also don't have the nostalgic feelings for it that I think a lot of people do, but I am enjoying watching it with Matthew and Jen because I think that they do have those feelings and are also pointing out the important scenes and lines that I think real fans of the movies are very hyped up about. And so I feel like I am seeing it through their eyes somewhat, even if I don't fully like feel it in my soul just yet. Number nine, multi-generational sagas. Never not in, always in forever. I <gasps> Clever! <laughs> So I thought I would wrap up the vlog here, given that it is now February 27th, but I thought I would wrap things up just with one last quick update on my reading and also a micro book haul. So this morning I finally got back to reading Starlight by Richard Wagamese. I'm not super far into it, so I will save my thoughts on this for a later date, although I'm still enjoying it very much. And then I came home this afternoon to a package from my friend Libby, which had Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon in it. This is a book that she has been encouraging slash begging me to read for several months now. Libby is a friend of mine who reads a lot and so I'm actually going to have her come on the channel later this spring to talk about some of her favorite books and so I am reading some of them in the meantime to be able to talk about them together. Priory is one of those books on the list so that was very sweet of Libby to send and I'm excited to get into it at some point in the near future. And then when I was walking home today someone had a box of free books out on their sidewalk which normally I find that those piles of free books don't have a lot of gems in them but this one had Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen Fielding, which feels like such a windfall because I was literally thinking yesterday about how I would love to go back and revisit Bridget Jones, having now read a bunch of those Vary McFarlane books, just to kind of remind myself of how this book actually reads and to kind of give myself a refresher on the sort of original chiclet template. Obviously influenced by Jane Austen, but then very influential on the chiclet of the last couple decades. So love that for me. And yeah, thus concludes my winter reading vlog. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments below what you have been reading and loving this winter. And if you have any books on your spring TBR or just on the horizon generally that you are excited to get to. As always, thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time. Bye!